Hello again, Lee Carson, coming to you from the First Methodist Church in Bullard, Texas. It's the uh, Fellowship Sunday School class. Just got word that uh, one of the ladies in our class has come down to Cobus. We'll be praying for her. Uh, God's been good to us so far. I think she's the first one in the church to have it. But getting on to the lesson, today's lesson is from the book of Daniel. And the title of it is Wisdom to Navigate Life's Challenges. The purpose of it is to learn how God's people receive God's wisdom. And the background is uh, from Daniel, first chapter, the first seven verses. The purpose that I read said uh, about God's people receiving God's wisdom. The last few months, uh, we've spent a lot of time, most of it in the Old Testament, uh, much of it with Isaiah, Jeremiah, some of the bigger prophets, and uh, a lot of it has been during the period of the divided kingdom and uh, their loss in not following God's law. So I thought, uh, how did the prophets communicate with God? Really doesn't say. And God communicated with Daniel to bring him to the place that he did in today's story. So I got to thinking about prayer because that's about the only way we have to communicate with God today. And there's one section in today's lesson that I inserted on prayer. And uh, you'll recognize it when I get to it. I just tried to fit it in. Getting along. For the past several weeks, we've been studying the Old Testament time during the fall of both the North and the South Kingdoms of Israel. And today's lesson comes from the time of Daniel when the Northern Kingdom of Israel had already fallen. And the Babylonians were beaten up pretty bad on the Southern Kingdom of Judah. Jehoiakim had been king of Judah for three years when Babylon attacked Jerusalem. A splinter group uh, got away, and against his will, they took Jeremiah with them and went to the Babylon, uh, for, got away from the Babylonians and escaped to Egypt. If you remember from last Sunday's lesson, when they got to Egypt, they told Jeremiah that he could tell. Them uh, his God that they were continuing to worship the queen of heaven because she treated them better. I really think that that incident was the boldest and most stupid sin they could have committed. Nebuchadnezzar simply walked in and took over Jerusalem, taking over all the gold and the artifacts from the temple and taking them back home and putting them in his God's treasury. When Nebuchadnezzar returned home, he told Ashpenaz, his highest official, to choose young men from Judah's royalty, members of the ruling class of Israel. They were to be good-looking young men uh, without defects, skilled, uh, having wisdom, possessing knowledge, conversant with learning, and capable of serving in his palace. Ashpenaz was to teach them the Chaldean language and its literature. The king assigned these young men daily rations from his own fine food and royal wine from his table. Among these young men from the Judeans were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But the chief official gave them names. He called Daniel Belshazzar, Hananiah was Shadrach, Mishael was Meshach, and Azariah was Abednego. As a child, my grandmother always told me Bible stories before we went to bed. I've mentioned it before. I love the ones about Daniel. And grandmother would say, okay, Lee, we're going to bed. 
And our story is going to be Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and then to bed we go. I always thought that was funny. Uh, that's my attempt at four-year-old humor. Uh, our scriptures, as I said, came from the first chapter of Daniel, 8 through 17th verses. Daniel decided that he wouldn't pollute himself with the king's rations or the royal wine, and he appealed to the chief official in hope that he wouldn't have to do so. Now God established faithfully, established faithful loyalty between Daniel and that chief official. But the chief official said to Daniel, I'm afraid my master, the king, who has mandated what you're to eat and drink, what will happen if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men in your group? The king will have my head because of you. So Daniel spoke to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Why not test your servants for 10 days? This is Daniel speaking. You could give us a diet of vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance to the appearance of the young men who eat at the king's food. Then deal with your servants according to what you see. The guard decided to go along with their plan and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, they looked better, healthier than the other young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard kept taking away the rations and the wine that they were supposed to drink and gave them vegetables instead. And God gave knowledge, mastery of all literature and wisdom to these four men. Daniel himself gained understanding of every type of vision and dream. And the key verse is the 17th. And God gave knowledge, master of all literature and wisdom to these four men. Daniel himself gained understanding of every type of vision and dream. When I first went to work for the Bureau of Prisons, it was the place I was working was a minimum security institution on Highway 175, about 10 miles southeast of Dallas. It was during the Vietnam War. The draft system was still in force. And about a third of our prisoners in this minimum security institution were Jehovah's Witnesses who were incarcerated for refusing to submit to the draft. The usual length of incarceration for them was the same time they would have served had they been drafted. They didn't have to go this route. They, they were all nonviolent young men in their late teens to early 20s. And one way that they could have gotten out of the draft was for conscientious objectors to accept training and then serve as a medic, and usually in the combat areas. If you saw the movie Hacksaw Ridge, Desmond was such an objector. He served in battle without a gun and probably served his country more effectively than if he'd carried a gun. During times of stress, we often have to choose one side or the other. We find that we can't just go along to get along. All of us remember September the 11th, 2001. We call it 9-11. That was a time of stress for all Americans. Churches filled up and people were discovering the importance of their faith. But then it didn't take long for most to find their faith more relaxed. In the United States, Christians are sometimes made un uncomfortable, but rarely are we really persecuted. Jesus uh, Jews taken to Babylon were not so much persecuted as they were tempted to be comfortable. They could easily slip into the belief system of the Babylon, Babylonians and found it easier to make excuses that justified their actions. The story of Daniel and his friends is more about temptation than terror. It was easy to go along with the culture of the Babylonians than to follow the commandments of God. The Israelites were taken into exile, exile in three waves. It seems that Daniel's group must have been in some of the earlier ones. He was in the first group to get to Babylon. The book of Daniel was very popular in Jesus' time because although they were back in their own country, 
They were still occupied by the Romans, just as they were in exile. In studying world history, we find that most history books are not written by those who were defeated, but by those who were the winners. The Israelites, however, seem to defy that wisdom because their history seems to be written about why they were conquered and most often by telling why God delivered them into the hands of their enemies. These young Jewish men were in training to become successful members of the Babylonian society and would have neither the time nor the inclination to be rebellious. However, eating vegetables and drinking water would ensure no connection to the Babylonian gods. Daniel and his friends were given opportunity to fill positions that would benefit God and his people. There's very little detail on how they communicated with God, as I mentioned when I started, and he with them. Even in Jesus' time, the disciples was, were concerned about their prayer life and went to Jesus asking him, Master, how should we pray? I thought this might be a good place to insert some thoughts that I've had on how we communicate with God. One way, ask in prayer, and God answers by way of uh, the Holy Spirit, or maybe the conscience. Our conscience is our Holy Spirit, because we have that feeling inside, Lee, you shouldn't have done that. Have you ever had mental twitch twitchiness? A time when your brain won't stand still? At bedtime, twitchiness can prevent, prevent your brain from relaxing and letting you drift off to sleep. Brain twitches also interfere with concentrating when you're concentrating on a speech or a lecture. And they certainly interfere with communicating with God. Prayer is the only way we have of communicating with God, determining the what, how, and why of what God has for us and the what and how we should do it. Staying focused during prayer sometimes requires more discipline than others. When I pray in public, for instance, it's easier for me if I concentrate on the what our groups are doing about or what they're about to do. In an intercessory prayer, when I'm praying for someone else, I need to concentrate on God's help for the other person or persons that I'm praying for. In praying alone, I can concentrate while doing something else, like working in the lawn, doing a task, driving the car, or walking. There used to be a sign on the sun visor of our church van that said, would the driver please keep their eyes open while praying? Humorous but true. We can pray anytime. Some things to remember when praying is, one, God is not Santa Claus. Then God will forgive me if I repent, ask for forgiveness, and forgive myself. If I need help in formulating my prayers, I might read some psalms. Psalms cover almost every human emotion. Anticipation, confusion, depression, desire, excitement, fear, guilt, hatred, jealousy, joy, love, pride, shame, sorrow, and vengeance. All of these are covered in the Psalms. Don't forget to praise God and remember, no whining. Does prayer work? Yes, if we're seeking God's will, but no, if we're seeking our own will. What posture do we use when we pray? Well, we can pray sitting, standing, kneeling, or walking. We can pray pouring out our soul to God, not holding back, being honest. And remember, he knows the truth. I try to always kiss my prayer. What do I mean by that? It means keep it simple, stupid. Don't use your prayer to impress God or others. Don't use superfluous words garnished with incense and flowery phrases. Neither do you need to use the old English language of the King James Bible. It doesn't hurt if you do. But we don't need to pray, We seek thy guidance, O Lord. 
talk to God like he's your best friend. He knows who you are. He knows how you speak. And he knows what you mean. Just be plain, honest, respectful language when you're talking to him. God is your father. A father who loves you. Who wants the best for you. And a father with whom you can be honest without fear or abuse. I hope these thoughts help you in your prayer conversations with God. I'm certainly working on mine. If everything else fails, you can always pray the Lord's Prayer. Now getting on with the story of Daniel, who was a good communicator and talked to God. Taking your meals at the king's table would normally have been an honor. But for Daniel and his friends, it presented a problem with the meat and the wine. The meat may have even been meat that was uh, given uh, in, to, the, to the strange gods that they worshipped. But it, whatever, their meat and wine wasn't what they would have eaten if they, and drank if they'd have been at home. They were not consistent with the Hebrew, Hebrew purity laws. It didn't take long for Daniel to establish a set between him and Ashpenaz the king's chief official. Hased means best friends, friends that had honor and trust, or in today's jargon, BFF, a bond between them that meant love and trust. Daniel didn't demand anything from Ashpenaz. He petitioned him. Ashpenaz was concerned that it might mean his job if the king found out so Daniel didn't want to pressure him. And he worked out a deal with one of the guards who wasn't concerned about his getting involved. Daniel proposed a 10 day test to the guard. And he said, if they don't look as good or better than those who ate all the king requested, then we'll eat what the king asked. At the end of the 10 days, after eating vegetables and drinking water, Daniel and his friends looked better than those eating the fine meat and drinking the best wines. Since they had proved themselves faithful to God, God gave the four young men the ability to master all that was presented to them. Actually, their appearance, their wisdom, their understanding came from God, not from Ashpenaz. By staying faithful, these four young men became educated and more learned than any of the other young men, and Daniel even became an interpreter of dreams. Judah was not overthrown by human forces, but by God. it was God's punishment for poor leadership and their rebellious acts, such as worshiping false gods. The story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego proves that some of them were good people and probably would have done well under better leaders. Daniel's refusal to eat the very best food offered by the king was not a matter of cultural taste, but of faith and commitment to God. His commitment, his determination to live for God, gained him good favor with the palace staff and officials. His demeanor was pleasant, his words were kind, without sacrificing his faith and gaining the good graces of his captors. Daniel's test of the food offered a challenge to him and the palace officials improving his diet was to be the one that worked out without offending the king. Life is full of tests and challenges. You remember Saturday Night Live from years ago? Remember, Rosanna, Rosanna, Dana, she'd say, it's always something. Kings of Assyria and Babylon destroyed Israel and Judah, killing, plundering, looting, and taking people as slaves. But if faithful Daniel had led God's people, it might have been different. Have you ever had the opportunity to observe the difference between first generation immigrants and those who were born and grew up here in the United States? When I was teaching public school, right at the end of my career, I was doing a lot of substitute teaching our English as a second language teacher became ill and missed about a semester of school. And she had a uh, teacher's aide that was Hispanic and, and of course spoke fluent Spanish. 
and she was my helper and we got along pretty good. And the kids that we have, the reason they were in there was because they immigrated with their parents into the United States. And when they came here, didn't speak a word of English. They were learning, learning it as they went in school. We used to give them little papers to write, like uh, what would be my favorite thing to do if I could do anything. Most of them wrote that they'd like to go back home where grandma and the rest of the family were. But anyway, they were the sweetest kids I think I ever worked with. They were respectful. I think almost every one of them was a Christian. And I was surprised, I thought they would all be Catholic. But mixed in with them, I found out there was a lot of Baptists and Methodists and other denominations. But they were good kids. Not so with the ones that were second and third generations that had been born here. They were like the rest of us. They became Americanized. What troubles and difficulties do we experience today that taste, test our faith? Today's news showed an owner of a large business who swore and yelled at a, a family celebrating a birthday because they were from the Far East. And he told them that they ought to get out of the restaurant and there was a lot of expletives in it. When he got home, he saw himself on TV where somebody had uh, taken a film with their camera and sent it into the station. He was surprised at himself. He apologized for it. But it's hard to get the horse back in after the stable's been opened. Last week, a woman in a park with her dog accused a black man who was bird watching of molesting her, but others that saw what went on testified on his behalf. Later, he asked the police to do nothing to the, uh, because the lady apologized. A few bad police in our country, and when I say a few, very few, are giving all law enforcement a bad name. People from all over the country were traveling miles to come and just join violent protests. Again, this week, a black man and a white man were walking into a park where all the people were white. A small crowd accosted them. They were threatening with lynching. As they were threatening to lynching, there was a woman who showed up in the film who was laughing hysterically. What helps you to discern the truth in bad situations? If you were there when the family in the restaurant was attacked and swore at for being there, if you were in the park when the lady lied about what the black man might have been trying to do to her, what would you do if you were there when one of those bad policemen did something he should have not done if it had been a white man. People from all over the country traveling miles just to be involved in a violent protest. What would we do if we were in one of those areas? How can we bring our country back to having faith in God? Probably the best thing we can do as Christians or to think with our heart and our soul and our faith at the poll and vote for the people that we feel will be the best in bringing our country back to center. And I'm not saying any particular uh, group of people, but look at the individuals. Let's have a prayer. Our Father and our God, help us to communicate with you to know what it is that you would like us to do and how we should go about doing it. Help us, Father, in keeping our heart and our faith straight. Help us, Father, to raise our children to live in the same way. Help us to work through our church. Help us be good people. We pray in Christ's name.